to see you. Thank you very much for coming. It's been great so far, hasn't it? It's been really interesting. Um, and, I, and I was saying to, to Ivan, who's going to come up in a moment, um, how wonderful it is to be. I've got a new job title, which is People Scientist. I love that. Um, I'm so glad that as a professor of psychology, I have some relevance in the real world. Anyway, as, as um, Perry was speaking earlier, there was something, and he was talking very much about AI and talking very much about the new world and, and so on and so forth, and this huge shift between 2021 and 2023. And I was kind of going back in history a little bit and thinking back to a famous quote by Albert Einstein. And he talked about, he said, no problem can be solved from the same level of consciousness that created it. So in a sense, we've seen this coming. This isn't something that's necessarily just popped up um, to bite us. It's something that, particularly those of us within the coaching and mentoring community, in a sense, we've been preparing for this for some time. In um, an era that's marked by so much societal, technological, environmental upheaval, which we're feeling now. The need for visionary leaders has never been more pressing. From widespread disillusionment with, um, as we've been hearing about sort of traditional leadership approaches to the urgent imperatives posed by climate change, by pandemics, geopolitical instability, the status quo is no longer tenable. So I've been interested listening to this morning about how organizations need a different kind of roadmap for cultivating these new essential qualities for tomorrow's leaders, for today's leaders. And it's more around a route for greater self-discovery of those essential qualities that we've seen talked about this morning and collective empowerment. So just a few words really about coaching and mentoring. It allows us to reimagine the very essence of what leadership is, uncovering truths that resonate far beyond the confines of the corporate world. We've seen this morning how we need to think more about embracing shared humanity and chart a course to a more compassionate and inclusive world, things that we've never really talked about in these kinds of fora before. And this really excites me not least because of my academic background. So as HR professionals and the kind of leaders and decision makers amongst us today, you're acutely aware already that businesses with, with a strong coaching and mentoring culture possess a significant advantage. Because amidst all of this seeming chaos and uncertainty, there's a unique opportunity to unlock genuinely transformative leadership, not just buzzwords of the moment. I'm talking here about properly authentic, human-centered and lasting leadership. So while we're feeling very, very tested, it's through effective coaching and mentoring that we can capture that and actually turn that into something incredibly productive and transformative. So I'm gonna talk a little bit historically now about a, a particular case study, which was the NHS. And we lived through this. We saw what happened um, during the pandemic, a hugely unprecedented challenge since wartime, uh, including surge in patient demand, limited resources, the need to um, adapt to new protocols week by week as the government changed the rules and regulations. And to address those challenges, the NHS invested very heavily in coaching and mentoring to take people through. Now, lots about that was great. Some of it was not so great. But if you look back on it now, it's very interesting, the things that have bubbled up and have really worked. And it was an interesting program because unlike a lot of things that we see, it was actually generally quite well received by trades unions and professional bodies such as, as the BMA. So looking at where the focus went, it was around compassion and communication. Coaching and mentoring programs were designed to provide emotional support as well as practical guidance to frontline healthcare workers, offering a listening ear, helping people to cope with their well-being at a time of a lot of change. 
leaders were coached specifically on effective communication, um, as well as decision making under pressure. And then coaches and mentors supported staff in building confidence as well as competence in these new practices. So you can see the kinds of more um, emotive, authentic, um, and psychologically informed approaches that we're seeing here. And now it in no way negates the harrowing situation. Of course, we've had inquiries at parliamentary level, but the impact of those transformations has actually been very positive and enduring. So one of the most significant advantages is to amplify shared values from coaching. Remote work, economic shifts, societal changes can easily fragment organisational culture and coaching and mentoring can serve as the glue that holds teams together. It fosters a sense of belongings, keeps people aligned, not the square pegs in round holes that used to characterise the way that we would use coaching in other worlds to support um, organisations. Coaching and mentoring will offer organisations a pathway to rapid innovation. So they're, and coaching and mentoring are by their nature disruptive. They're disrupting patterns of thinking. They're disrupting sedimented approaches. So the pillars of coaching and mentoring in these times, I would say, embracing authenticity, a cornerstone of effective leadership in an age of increasing transparency and interconnectedness is very much being true and being true to who you are. Communicating with emotional intelligence, vital for navigating complex interpersonal dynamics and fostering cohesive teams. Building trust, but not only that, psychological safety for teams. It's a linchpin for organizational success particularly in times of uncertainty. And then fostering inclusion, inclusive and diverse environments are not just moral imperatives, but they're essential drivers of innovation and resilience. But I just want to be clear here that not all coaching and mentoring programs are created equal. High quality bespoke initiatives tailored to the specific needs of organizations and employees are essential. Off the shelf solutions simply won't cut it in today's complex and rapidly evolving business environment. So welcome to Ivan, our president, who's gonna say a little bit more on that. Thank you. Afternoon, everyone. Oh, hopefully you can hear me. Brilliant at the back. Thank you so much. Three thumbs up. Uh, pleasure to be here. Um, I haven't got a script. There's no slides. Um, I do welcome, if you've got any questions at all later, just come and see me. Come and find me or contact me via email or LinkedIn, whatever works for you. You'll see, a, you'll see an email address I've just noticed on the slide up there. If you just put ivan.beaumont, and then do emccuk.org, uh, then you'll, you'll find me via email. Um, I haven't got a script. Um, there's no slides. And I'm going to respond and change it a little bit about what I was going to say based on what we heard this morning. Um, but one of the things that I thought I'd start with, uh, what I was thinking about in terms of coaching and mentoring and um, HR and leadership and managers, we're talking about change, we talk about transformational change, and if you think about it from a, a, a life cycle perspective, what you need for it to, to work, to be successful, is some support in the middle. That's where your coaches sit, that's where your, your mentors sit, and your HR professionals uh, sit as well. Um, they're almost there to orchestrate, uh, another word that we heard earlier. So the, the movement for, that we're seeing at the moment is leaders and managers becoming able to orchestrate change, uh, to have those sort of core coaching skills to, to support them to do that. Uh, so that's a bit about why coaching and mentoring. There's a huge amount of change going on, uh, and hence it's becoming very, very popular. Uh, but who are EMCC UK in, in, in this? 
Uh, so we're a professional membership body. We've got some community of 4,000 plus people. That's a growth of some 30% in the last 12 months um, uh, as well. And to tell you a bit about us, our guiding principles, which sort of tell you quite a lot about who we are and what we do, are that we're inclusive, we're progressive. What do I mean by progressive? Uh, we're associated with a lot of uh, um, academic institutions. We're looking at the latest research and we embed that and share it with our, with our community of, of coaches and mentors, etc. We're very supportive as well, supportive of change, supportive of our members, supportive of organisations uh, that you represent here today. And we're professional. And I'll come back to the professional uh, because I'm assuming that some of you buy coaching uh, and the emphasis around professionalism is important there. Um, why would you go to EMCC UK as a go-to body for, for coaching? Um, we're run by volunteers. We have some 167 active volunteers currently. Uh, we deliver lots of CPD, supervision, um, opportunities, lots of special interest groups, um, etc. on a very wide range of topics from health and well-being to technology to neurodiversity to higher education, etc. Um, I mentioned we're research-led. So we have uh, relationships with quite a few academic bodies, such as Harriet Watts and Oxford Brooks. Um, but I think it's important to, uh, to, to tie back into the professionalism when you're buying coaching. And, and in terms of supporting transformational change across organisations, then there's a lot to choose from in terms of coaching. Uh, and you need to potentially engage with all of these different levels. Um, I think of it as a type of continuum from on the left, on my piece of paper, I talk about this sort of expertise, expert coaches, typically external. Some people might say they're great or master coaches. They're involved in transformation rather than transactional change. You see them operating at board level with executives. Uh, you see them today more increasingly working with teams, teams of teams and at organisational level. Um, there will be niche coaches in there uh, as well. They typically have some sector experience. You see that more and more. Uh, then you have the sort of digital platforms. I had to talk about technology. You have the providers via digital platforms. Um, typically they're good coaches. They may be quite inexperienced as well. They're coaches who find it difficult to find clients. Um, uh, don't like marketing. Uh, those are the types of people that you see using those platforms. Uh, there are big providers there, the, the, the likes of Coach Hub, Ezra and others, Better Up, for example. Then you're seeing organisations continually developing internal pools of coaches uh, as well. There's an element of ebb and flow around that, as it's not a core, uh, core business uh, activity. Uh, it can be very popular, it can dwindle. You see that over, over periods of times. Internal coaching pools are typically very well trained and uh, they can have great coaches in, good coaches, inexperienced coaches uh, as well. Um, increasingly, we're seeing leaders and managers be developed as coaching, uh, having a coaching mindset, coaching approach to support their, their people as individuals through change. Um, Typically, they're being developed in terms of core coaching skills, uh, things like being able to pay attention in the moment, um, to listen well to their people, to treat everyone as individuals and unique, uh, to have a, 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 be able to ask some powerful questions as well, to support people through change, uh, to achieve um, whatever they would like to achieve and uh, to be able to give feedback and also to spend time to reflect. It's part of a learning process. And when I was thinking about the Agile and the, uh, the need for quick pace, 
Um, that isn't necessarily what coaches encourage. Uh, there's an element of slowing the pace down. Why do we do that? Um, we like to encourage people to be creative and innovative and um, that requires an element of slowing down. We want leaders to take time to gather perspectives, to engage with all of the people around them in their networks, in their teams, uh, to tap into some, it can be corporate or organisational networked wisdom so they can make wise choices. So it's very much about being responsive to issues and problems rather than being reactive and making quick decisions. Um, you've stood up, so I've not got too much time left. I'll quickly talk about the future of coaching and mentoring, and I'll, I'll tap on the fact that there will be inevitably more use of technology. Uh, technology is disrupting the coaching industry. There'll be coaches who use technology. There'll be uh, organisations that look to replace coaching with technology. Um, I call it an AI coach, more like a, an AI digital assistant. It will work very well in certain countries where there are not enough coaches uh, available. Globally, we've got about 109,000. That's clearly not enough coaches to, uh, to, to support everyone everywhere. This will lead to things like digital ethics and standards. So if you work with a digital platform provider, they really ought to be signing up to digital ethics. Uh, and standards. If not, think about insurance and whether they'll be still insured. Uh, there's definitely going to be impact on accreditation. Uh, you'll see the development of internal pools more frequently, certainly a development in terms of leaders and managers' skills, you know, able to be a more coaching, a coach-like coaching mindset and approach. Definitely a move towards teams from individuals uh, very much supporting leadership development. And the popularity of mentoring is likely to increase as well. Just a reminder, if you've got any questions at all, that was a really rapid fire. Not enough time. I like to talk forever about coaching. Um, I am a coaching practitioner. So if you've got any questions at all, please do come and find me and, uh, or contact me. Uh, afterwards. So thank you very much. Thank you.